Prime Minister Sturer, your country shares a border with Russia. You're a member of NATO. How has the war in Ukraine changed thinking in Norway? Well, I would say fundamentally, like in other European countries and especially bordering countries, that we wake up and, and learn that our neighbour has attacked another neighbour massively. And as we have seen since February, uh, basically uh, aiming at destroying uh, buildings, uh, workplaces, infrastructure, uh, driving millions of people uh, escaping. It is a fundamental change to the whole European landscape. Uh, so, yes, it is, it is crucial. Our neighbours, Sweden and Finland, who have been outside NATO, uh, decided quickly that they wanted to be in NATO. We don't have a, a perceived uh, direct threat at our border, like what we have seen in Ukraine, but of course we are taking measure to safeguard our security. I mean, you said in the past that Russia and Norway have been at peace for more than a thousand years. Do you think there is a direct threat to Norwegian territory or perhaps to Norwegian infrastructure coming from Russia? After what Russia has demonstrated in Ukraine, nobody can, can, can hide away that question, you know, deny it. Uh, again, you know, Russia has moved both people and military equipment from the north to Ukraine. Uh, so we observe that uh, and we don't observe direct attention uh, at our border. But of course, we, we uh, follow uh, developments in our near abroad. Uh, we sail our navy, we fly our patrol planes to, to monitor uh, the situation. And uh, we do that very closely with our uh, Nordic uh, partners, but also with our NATO partners. So when we now put a major emphasis on securing our infrastructure, we do that uh, as Norway, and we do that in close cooperation with our allies and partners, and uh, first among them with Germany. You're here in Berlin for a security conference uh, and for talks with the German government. Uh, let's talk about NATO's stance. Is it the right one providing technical support uh, but waiting essentially for Ukraine to win the war on its own? That might take a very long time. Is it the right approach? Well, you know, this, this is not a war against uh, NATO territory but close to NATO territory and uh, Ukraine is a free democratic nation that deserves support. And I think both Norway and Germany made a very uh, historic decision back in February to, to offer military equipment to a country at war. And we have done so in Norway. We have not done that since the 1950s. And, and you know, we now provide military equipment. It is Ukraine's right to defend itself, and it is our right to help Ukraine defend itself. But, but again, I think you know, uh, it, will, uh, it will be irresponsible uh, to kind of pull NATO into this uh, conflict as it stands, but to support Ukraine and to do everything we can that this war uh, should stop. And it should stop by stopping Russian aggression. Ukraine has the right to defend itself. What should be the consequences for Russia from its aggression? Should it be more isolated, do you think, in the future? And should indeed Ukraine be brought more closely into uh, if you like, the Western alliance? Well, Ukraine has its European track uh, towards membership of the European Union, which is, of course, a pretty long exercise, but I think that's a good, good sign. Um, uh, Russia is hit by major economic sanctions, which I, I, I know they, they must have expected. This was made very clear from, from countries around that if you revert to open war against a neighbouring country, it will have consequences. So Norway has been supporting all of those uh, packages from the European Union, you know, aligning ourselves with them. Then we have to lift and our, our perspective and look ahead. You know, there will be a day after this uh, conflict and Russia will not go away. And we have to think about the European security structure where countries can live side by side and having a political toolbox where we, if there are problems, we deal with them politically and not by war. But right now it's about, uh, you know, helping Ukraine to survive. Uh, as a result of the war, or after the closure of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, Norway is now the largest exporter of gas to, uh, to Germany and to Western Europe. Um, we've seen those explosions on the gas pipelines in the Baltic. Are you worried about those direct threats to that energy infrastructure? Well, it would be naive to say that it has no meaning. You know, it, of course, it is a, an, an extraordinary sign that uh, obviously this has been sabotage against the Nord Stream pipeline, although they were not operating with gas. 
Um, so Norway has high security around our infrastructure. We've had that for many, many years. We have increased that security since February. So we have a close cooperation between police and defense. We have an increased uh, surveillance uh, uh, along the whole system. You know, we have three major land installations. We have 90 platforms out there on the shelf, and we have about 9,000 kilometers of pipelines. But I can assure you, we look after them pretty closely, and we do that also now with our allies. So alongside, for example, Germany, United Kingdom, France, Netherlands, we sail uh, more actively together. And the Chancellor and I, we, we have agreed that, you know, this issue about safeguarding infrastructure is also a NATO issue. So we will propose to our NATO allies that uh, this is something we should look into, coordinate our efforts, because critical infrastructure is um, key to security. Okay, high energy prices have boosted the profits for uh, sales of uh, Norwegian oil and gas. Um, and there have been calls from countries like Germany for lower prices or something to be done about it. Is that a fair request? I think it's a very fair request to hope for lower prices of energy. And I can tell you, it is not in Norway's interest that you have high and volatile energy prices in Europe. I'll give you three examples for that. High gas prices in Europe means very high electricity prices in Norway. And in families in Norway, they heat their houses with electricity. So that's a direct negative sign. Secondly, uh, uh, Europe's industry is Norway's partner. You know, we have to work with them, so problem for European industry is problem for our industry. And thirdly, these energy prices create social unrest, which is not good for us as partners and NATO allies. So we will do everything we can to support measures to stabilize markets and bring prices down. But the reasons why prices are high is that there is a shortage of energy, because Russian gas is no longer there. So we have done everything we can to increase our sales of gas. We've increased them by almost 10% to the maximum. But then we have to move on with Europe to produce more energy and they will have to come from renewable sources, from offshore wind, from solar, from land wind and from hydrogen. And all these issues are on the agenda when we now meet with Germany. Are the Norwegian government still selling licenses for more oil and gas exploration? Uh, in the North Sea, uh, and you're promoting that. Is that compatible with the goal of uh, reducing CO2 emissions and reducing emissions, getting away from fossil fuels in future? We must get away from fossil fuels. And, and we have targets of cutting emissions from our uh, shelf by 50% by 2030. We have to go into carbon capture and storage. If we're going to reach our climate objectives worldwide, we have to move forward on that. Um, Norway is looking after potential gas founds in the North Sea, close to our existing installation, close to where there is activity. But we are moving into a future where that production will go down. And in parallel, we will have increase of offshore wind production, floating offshore wind production, which is a technologically very advanced operation. So gradually you will see that we are going through this change together and we will be producing renewable energy for Norway and for uh, contribut contributing to Europe. Final question, you're here in Berlin for the Berlin Security Conference. What can these kind of gatherings achieve? Is even more coordination and cooperation between the Western partners needed at this time? Yes, and I mean, I, I think one vision that President Putin may have had was that the Western cohesion would fall apart. It, it has not happened. Although, you know, there is pain coming from the economic consequences, the biggest pain in Ukraine, of course, I mean, it's extraordinary what, what they are now have to, having to take. But for all of us, it's, it's demanding times. But the cohesion is very strong. So these, these conferences, I think, are important to compare notes, to sit down and, and, and look into what we can do together. We have to continue to support Ukraine. Uh, in the budget that I have presented for 2023, I am announcing that Norway, early next year, will announce a major uh, multi-year package for Ukraine, where we will take some of the uh, benefits we've had from uh, energy exports and, and look at where is the uh, source of this. It, it, it comes from what happened in Ukraine. And we will also be stepping up our aid to the countries beyond Europe that are now suffering from high food prices, high energy prices. And for all of this to work, we have to coordinate ourselves. You cannot be kind of 50 different initiatives. And, and for Norway, coordinating with Germany is a key part of that strategy. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Thank you.